We discussed um, a lot. There was a lot to unpack. Yeah, she gave me some snowboard stories. <laughs> Uh, the time she got hit by a ski person. Um, we talked about uh, masturbation for a split second. <laughs> we talked about her um, her arch nemesis from primary school that she uh, she talked about on stage once. And uh, we we uh, learnt a lot about how to become a stand up comedian and uh, what it's like being someone who's uh, probably in her menopause right now. <laughs> Did you like that one? No, not really. You um, laughed? Oh, she laughed. She laughed. <laughs> we're all, we're all, we're, we like to have fun here. Yeah, we're we're fun. Welcome to the Sevo Show. We have Jill Courtner here from Glasgow. She's Scottish. You will find out more as she talks. And uh, we will be subtitling this episode <laughs> just in case you can't understand the heavy accent for all the viewers on YouTube. Uh, you're welcome. If you're on Spotify and you can't understand it, just get your local Scotsman to... Uh, Come in and uh, give you a translation. Thanks for coming. So, uh, subtitles for the hard of thinking. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, former teacher, now comedian. Mm. What happened? Uh, midlife crisis. I've, I've had many midlife crises. Um, actually, no. I've, I don't know. I think I was always that awkward and uncomfortable person that um, said the wrong things at the wrong time. Like, I went to a um, work event with my husband and we were standing next to his boss and they handed us a plate of oysters. And instead of just saying, no, I don't like oysters, I said, I couldn't eat them, they look like vaginas, right? Now, that's not the right thing to say in front of your husband's boss. Mm. And <laughs> but to me, it seemed like the right response mm. because that bit of your head that would normally go... Don't say that horrible thing. Um, I never had it. I never had a filter. And then I stumbled upon stand up and I went on stage once and that was it. I was like a heroin addict. I just, that was it. Did you do a lot of like a pause? I did. I got like, I didn't, I was a brought room the first time out. Well, I've looked to the clip back and it's actually diabolical, but at the time, um, in the context of being like the first time on stage, I got tons of laughs, and, and that is it. It's that weird um, acceptance or um, admiration or, I don't know, being in school. I don't know what it is, but there's something about people laughing at what you say. Instead of just raising their eyebrows and going, show me hard, you know what I mean? Because that's the normal response is like, just shut up, Jill. And I'm looking at my husband going, jeez, you know, like me, all, like I'm always embarrassed. Do you write him laugh? No, no, really. I think I just annoy him and he annoys me. That's marriage, you know, like, get real with it. If you're, if you're engaged, it wouldn't, it's a trap. <laughs> well, I'm two years in. Orange. Good luck. Yeah. Yeah, it's good in there. No, it's yeah. good. Look, I mean, I, I think your tolerance of each other, like, your infinite tolerance is not a thing. Like, you, the longer you're married, the, the more each other annoy. And then it's just like you just led with each other's aggravation. It's yeah. just managing your aggravation. It is, yeah. Like, it. like I, I, every time I make my wife laugh, it's like a massive win. Yeah. It, well, it's good. She laughs. Yeah. Well, me, I've got two kids and uh, they think they're funny as well. Everybody thinks they're funny. And, and the thing that they do is they try and burn each other and... And, and some of it's quite good, and we have to acknowledge a sick burn. So that's as much yeah. uh, humour. But I try and avoid it at home because at the end of the day, I do it for a living. So um, yeah. I kind of like, you're not as funny at home. You're just grumpy and annoyed at the dishwasher smell. My daughter put um, fabric conditioner pouches. Do you know, like the ones, they look like dishwashing tablets. She put one of them in her dishwasher. And our dishwasher has smelled like frangipani for six months. And I cannot tell you how annoyed that makes me. Every time I open that door and I just get this wafted, you know. It just must have like adhered like, like a nuclear film to the inside of the dishwasher. There's nothing that's gotten rid of it. I mean, I even put bleach in the bed. It could be worse though. Could, could be it? smells. Could, well, it? could be smelling like shit. Yeah, well, if you want to shit in your dishwasher, good luck to you. That's a kink that I haven't heard of. Well, I mean, 
could be, it could be. It depends on the ambulance cycle, depending on how, how it was the motion it was. That's true. So how long have you been in comedy for now? Uh, four years. Four years, and you're already uh, award-winning, you're a comedy, comedy lounge, comedy comedian of the year. Yes. And I think that's about all I can remember. I uh, won the funniest five as well this year, which was a competition. Um, and yeah, it's been great. Like I've, I've, I've done really well last year, so I'm hoping this year to do even better. But um, limited expectations, for kids. <laughs> <laughs> so what's your like? What's your ultimate goal? Do you have one? Um, to escape my bottle coil. Uh, no, it just I think. Probably just to do a bit of travelling and, and and be dead good and everybody's going, oh, she's really good, you know. And I'm not saying never bomb because you're always going to bomb, but um, I'd like to travel, I'd like to go to other places um, and I'd like, I, I don't do that whole, like, oh, I want to do arenas and I do Netflix specials. I don't, I just kind of want to do the next bit and then the next bit. Yeah, and the next it was a journey. Bit. Yeah, I'm just, I'm like a caterpillar or a leaf. I don't look at the bush, I just look at the leaf and see what the next yeah. bit and one shin to do is. Because I think if you get too sort of far ahead of like your expectations, I don't know, it, it confuses me. So I just look at the next goal, which yeah. is, yeah. What sort of comedy style do you uh, lean towards? Um, I suppose observational comedy and um, very, very down earth stuff. Like I just, my family, my life, it's boring and it's, it annoys me and everything kind of annoys me and and so it's mostly that it's just things that annoy me really and and um, people around me and stuff that happens like it's very it's very day to day I don't do anything particularly political or controversial and I swear a lot and I like that I used to in the beginning people would say you know well you swear too much and I really had to swear on this podcast. Yeah, fuck it. Okay. Go for it. Uh, people used to say to me, like, you swear too much. And I'd say, well, fuck, you know, like, I like swearing. I'm Scottish. And, and, and being Scottish, you send your DNA to swear and to swear well. I mean, we, we, we really did invent how to use swear words in every single sentence. And then you come over to Australia and Australians, they like to swear as well. So that, like, the double whammy of coming from two cultures that, entirely love expletives. Um, I was telling you that you swear to me. I think people do like feel that perhaps it's um, like, hilariously on Sunday, a comedian, not a comedian, an Irish woman uh, came with me up after a gig and said she thought it was undignified of a lady of my age to swear it so much. And I was like, well, fuck, A, I am a lady, B, who wants to be dignified? You know, I don't remember that. I'm not up there in a tuxedo on the top hat, but you know, my kid. Yeah, what sort of shit? It's like, you, it's like, what do you think this is? It's like, yeah, fuck off. You know, like you, if you want to ask us, here, you want to do comedy, you do it how you like. But I like swearing. It's a release for me. And um, especially if you've got kids, you bottle it up for years. You know, like, you don't swear in front of them. And then they get to be teenagers. And you just think, well, that was a waste of fucking time because they're the. They're the lippies we get, you can get. It's like my son would come with a vape in any school bag. How old was he? Well, oh, he's 15 and a half, he's a wee dick. But anyway, um, he called him a vape. And, and I thought, if you could fast forward your life to your teenage kids, and I look at my big deal that have your old son with his mullet and his vape and all of this, his shit. I would not have matched up organic pumpkin for him and I wouldn't have breastfed him and I've given an Aldi formula, you know, like you do all that stuff in the beginning because you think, you know, this is going to shape them as human beings and it does, doesn't. You'd be as well just like, you'd be as well smoking crack and swearing and shooting dogs in your living room. I don't know, but, you know, like you, you, you molly coddle them, you, make, you give them this like perfect environment, going to sleep in organic bamboo sleep so it's just so what do you think went wrong oh fuck <laughs> I don't know he, look, he's a great kid but like what what my point of that is is what you think your expectations in the beginning all this sort of like perfect environment doesn't necessarily create this thing they're, they're their own people you know yeah. and I want me to be his own person and he definitely is his own person just got to guide them to a point where they don't die but you've got to give them their own, their own choices as well and you know we all I mean at that age I, I was worse than he was you know what I mean 
I hope he never sees his best. I, I, you know, I was terrible at that age. So, like, I remember what that age is like. And that is where you want to just... You turned out all right. <laughs> That's Stop terrible. Marrying. Stop marrying. I'm hanging on, mate. I'm like, I'm like someone just hanging on the edge of a cliff just with the fingernails and each fingernail's cracking one at a time, you know? I just... So are you, are you, are you okay? <laughs> okay. I'm okay, but comedians are all a bit tapped to me. Well, I had Andrew Wolf last week. Oh, well, there you go. So he, he sets the bar high with that one. Yeah, he does. None of us are, none of us are normal and none of us are particularly mentally, and I'm not saying unstable, but we're all a bit ski with. Yeah, I've got a lot to say. And Dave, like Dave Hughes, my friend, he said that you should do stand up. And I, and I'm like, I'm not ready. And, and I'm like, when are you ready? When are you ready? I was 50. Well, I was 50, so I'm 56. And then, so I was 52 when I started. I, would, I could have done it at any point in my life. It just never occurred to me. However, doing it late on in life um, makes it much harder because nobody really loves the idea of middle-aged people in any sphere of life, you know, like, well, I think you're better as a community. Oh, yeah, 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 in some ways you are, but a lot of middle-aged comedians are god-awful as well, but because it's like a kind of hobby thing and there's an entitlement oh, thing, to, you know, and that, that is different, but I, I think um, to start old is hard. It's hard to be new and old, yeah. and that's the thing. Like, I'd never been described as an up-and-coming comic. Never, you know, even though at 40... You just appear like a McDonald's. Yeah, because people look again and, and in their mind they're like, well, you look like you should have been doing it 20 years, even though you haven't. So you never get the same latitude as a young comedian because yeah. they look at them and go, oh, they're a young comedian, you know, you can be shy, that's okay. But when you're an older comedian, I think people don't... Yeah. Like, do you know what I mean? It's I, like I, a bias. For me, for me, it's just like I personally prefer the older comedians because they're more relatable and they've got enough kilometres under their, their hood that yeah. they, they know what they're talking about and they can really draw in a story. Whereas young comedians, they rely on sarcastic humour, which I'm kind of over. Or they just go straight to the vagina jokes and more the females. What what sort of, like you say <laughs> you said you're observational. Do you do you never do you follow James. that? Do you follow because because a lot of female comics and this is a generalisation yeah. obviously, but the ones that I've seen, uh, which is a few, they're all going to the dicks and the dating and the, the sexual shit. Oh look, I don't mind sex jokes and I, and I do a lot of the sexual content. Um, because it's funny it and, is, and we yeah. all enjoy, I don't really do dick jokes per se, but I do like jokes about, most of my jokes are about avoiding having sex. So I do the sort of nemesis of that um, and I'm not single, so I'm not doing Tinder jokes. Um, a lot of mine's is just about how I'm a bit lazy and a bit middle-aged and I, I prefer cheese over sex. But I mean, <laughs> you know, like I'm okay with that because I think we live in a society that sort of thinks you know, sexual liberation's about, you know, doing as much as you want, and it is, but it's also about doing as little as you want, you know, like, mm. if I, if I don't, if, if that's where I'm at in my life, then that's where I'm, that's what I'm reflecting, I'm not talking about, I talk a lot about, um, younger guys have a bit of a bizarre obsession with, like, the step mum and um, <laughs> mature <laughs> mature lady porn, right? And I have a bit of fun with that because it, to me that is hilarious. It is. Because um, all, you see all these like really like beautiful girls in the audience and I just think there's no point in like, like you are at the absolute physical peak of your life. This is it. And at the end of the day, the young guys are all getting off to, like, horny milfs in your <laughs> area. And I just think, that's funny, stepmom porn as well. I just think somewhere out there, there's a stepson wanking to stepmom porn. And that, to me, just is just the, do you know what I mean? It's like the craziest thing, you know. And I, I do jokes about that, so. About wanking? Well, yeah, because it's a funny thing, isn't it? Yeah. You know, have, you, have your uh, have kids, I, have your kids, uh, <laughs> have you begun discovering the crusty socks yet? Uh, no, I do, I do a joke about um, 
my son having 20 minute showers and <laughs> we all know what you do in the shower <laughs> your mum knows because I'm you know like but nah he, he's they're quite clean I, I I I want my children to be clean in the if they do whatever you do do what you do clean your mess up that's all I would say mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> we've all been there uh, yeah we've all been there I mean like that's the thing is it's like People look at older, like especially sort of middle aged or older people, and, and just assume they're not like they they're not watching porn and, and they're not doing. And you know, we're all like I'm an eighteen year old trapped in this body. Mm. You know, uh, like it, you don't you don't age in your mind. You know, so yeah. So I spoke about that earlier today, actually, with my my father in law. You don't age in your mind. No, and he's, you don't. he's he's over sixty now. He says the same thing. When and so the stand-up's good for that yeah. because, like, I'll go on stage and I'm quite outrageous, I suppose, in a lot of ways and I'll say what I like in any way that I please. And I think I I, I like the fact that it maybe resets the narrative on, like, you're not a relevant human being, you know, you're you're yeah. just, you know, sitting at home doing Sudoku. And <laughs> <laughs> I said that this morning as well. <laughs> sitting at home doing Sudoku and, and watching well. Married at First Sight, you know, like, oh, like that's not, the, that's some people's reality, you know, but like. Sounds boring. I, I'm I'm not in it. I don't want to play golf and I'm happy to be a golf, you know. I mean, I'm not saying <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm not saying I want my kids to be, I, somebody has called me a golf once and I said. Again. I said, I'm not a gelf. I want to be a milf first because my children aren't old enough to have their children. So. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I want milf time before gelf time. Do they have friends coming over, like looking at you? No. you know, not yet? No. No, I, no, they're all scared of me. None They'll become of... Stifler's mum sort of vibes? Nah, not at all. Not like, I do love her though. Um, Jennifer Coolidge is yeah. just like. She's all over TikTok. Oh, doing she's it well. fantastic. And she did that whole thing on her acceptance speech about, you know, like. I, that she'd given up the idea of, of of being anything, you know, like she felt like her moment had passed and that sort of life was passing her by a wee bit. And then she got this opportunity and all of a sudden she's just blown up to be this amazing. And I just think that's so touching and lovely and, and relevant to me as well because I suppose you kind of do think maybe like... like Maybe maybe my my dreams of fame and fortune have passed me by and this is it. Or you go, you hope put a halt on that narrative and go, I'm not dead yet. I'm not ready for pipe and slippers and taking up lawn bowls. <laughs> I, I'm like, I'm changing, I'm flipping that script and going, nah, I'm just starting, you know. So yeah. I don't ever accept that, like, tip for by, from anyone. It's easy. It's easy to say that when you're young, though. Yeah, but yeah. when you when you get older and like you do get bit bypassed, I think I found that I was invisible or I was getting invisible, and 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 I thought I don't really want that to be me. Mm. I don't want to be just a faceless middle aged woman shuffling Jeez. in and out. I wonder what I feel like with with my following. I don't I don't feel faceless, but like with yourself, you did. You were a teacher. Were you teaching school? I was a lecturer. School? I, a lecturer. I did uh, um, fine art and I, I ended up teaching in a college like similar to TAFE in the UK. And how long did you do that for? 12 years. Yeah. And then I had a bit of a midlife crisis. A uh, relationship uh, broke down, a long-term relationship. And um, I thought I can either stay in my job with everybody going, hmm. You're divorced, you know. Mm, come on out, you can come out for a drink with us. Or I could just leave everything. And I went and I worked in Europe for two and a half years doing ski seasons. Oh. And the summer seasons as well. So. Well, like chairlift and stuff? No, first season I did, uh, I worked as a holiday like rep and I snowboarded in Italy. Oof. And then the second season, which was summer. And that was in Austria. I uh, ran a chalet in Kitzbühel in Austria, which was fantastic. And then the next winter, actually, no, the first winter was France, Austria. Then I did Italy. And the job I got in Italy, oh, my God. So I went as a chef. Actually, no, I went as a holiday rep in Italy for a holiday company. And the snowboard guide for the company broke his leg. 
and I was the only one who snowboarded. And they're like, you could do the guiding. And I'm like, ah, oh, yeah. And they're like, we'll give, you, we'll give you more money. And I was like, oh, like, you have to do it. And I was shite at snowboarding. Like I was really, I had really nice equipment. Yeah. Because like when I was stationary, I looked great. You know, like at the top <laughs> of the ski lift, I'd just be like that. I had a, I had a friend who had a snowboarding shop in Aberdeen. He kitted me out with all this amazing gear. But I wasn't really that, that good. So I got this job um, guiding. And so what you're meant to do is you're meant to like take groups of people up the slope seven but I was I wasn't that good and I didn't know any good routes so what I used to do is I'd take them up in the lift and we'd get off the lift and I'd point them in a direction and go this is where we're going you go and I'll follow at the back because I was slower than the people I was guiding right so this was how I got out of and I was like I'll come up the rear and protect you all, you know, like in some sort of like, and they were like, yeah, yeah, that sounds good. And I did that and I, I was so out of my depth, like, and I'd always be getting invited to things that were snowboardy, right? Well, all the cool snowboardy folk. And I was so rubbish at it. Like they took me off piste one day, this whole group of snowboard guides. Um, and we, we hiked up this mountain and we got on this ledge, and it was like a cliff thing, and then there was this big powder field down it, right? And there was about six of us, and they said, we'll all take it in turns, go down there. And there's this beautiful bit of pristine slope. And I thought, that's too steep for me. <laughs> like, I, I can't do the really steep stuff, right? Like, I never went on the steep stuff. And and, and, and I went, oh, I'll do. So I pretended I was, like, fidgeting with my bindings. So trying in my mind to think of a way out of this. Like, if I could, like, have a binding malfunction, I could, like, get out of it. And 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 they went down and down and down. And there's, like, one guy in front of me. And he goes, do you want to go? you want to go before? I was like, no, 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 it's okay. And I'm watching them carving these big swaves. So now they've all gone down. And I'm sat at the top of this cliff on my snowboard going, there's only one way down and, and and I'll probably die if I try and snowboard down this. So I have to get down and not die. So they're now all waiting at the bottom. And what I did is if you snowboard and you want to stop, you do, you go on your heels and you just go, and I, did, I just heel edged it all the way down. <laughs> To the degree that I caused a small avalanche because I created so much snow under my board that it formed this massive big thing of snow that then dropped off and then started going dung, 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 dung. So they're up. watching me going, what the fuck is she doing? And they're waiting because like, they'd taken like 10 seconds to go down. I took about four minutes with this massive clump of snow under my board. And when I got to the bottom... Like nobody would look at me. It was so embarrassing. It was just, it was, and that I've been out my depth my whole life. But I ended up, I got hit by a skier when I was guiding. Well, when I say I was guiding, when I was following my punters across the snow, and he came off a ridge and hit me side on, um, and knocked me out, and and he fucked off and left me for dead on this on the slopes. And then I woke up in the helicopter because I'd been knocked out. Um, and I wouldn't wake up, I wouldn't come to, I kept like drifting in and out of consciousness because it's these open sided rescue helicopters and it was in Italy and the guy in the back of the helicopter had on one of those like, you know, those like mirrored visors and I thought I was in a Vietnam film. <laughs> I thought I was dreaming about a film. So every time I opened my eyes, it was going... And I was watching Tour of Duty at that time, so I thought it was maybe that. So every time I saw him, I'd just let shut my eyes and go back to sleep. Did you hear Fortunate Sun playing in the background? <laughs> it, just, it was that. <laughs> and I kept opening my eyes going, oh, this is a nice dream. And when we got to the hospital, I'd broken some ribs and punctured a lung. And then I lost my job as a snowboard guide. So, oh, that was all right. That was shy. I was so bad at it. But um, yeah, I I was quite ill for a long time. Nobody in the hospital spoke any English. It's just, oh, it was grim. It was yeah. like a grim time. We were in Italy last year for a wedding. And uh, a day before, one of the guests, because we had, we all stayed at this accommodation right where the wedding was. 
And it was a really nice area in in, uh, in Luca, oh, near, near Luca. Mm. And um, yeah, the guy they were playing soccer or something in the in the paddock, and he snapped his Achilles. And then he had to go to the hospital, and yeah. he was there for eight hours to no like no surgery because yeah. of some insurance shit or something. He had insurance, but just yeah, they they needed to do something or something. And then anyway, he came back the next day. Came he had cast like yeah. like sling on shit. And then he had to go straight away back home to Holland because he's from Holland <laughs> and to get his surgery because you can't let your Achilles no. heal uh, heal too much because you're fucked. But, yeah, um, yeah, that was my story of Italy. But, yeah, I love snowboarding. I went to Japan. Yeah, I mean, I loved it. I did three yeah. ski seasons. I did two Italian ones. Um, the second one I did before I uh, got busted, I <laughs> – the, it was in Livigno. No, my first ski season in Italy was in Livigno. And at that time, MTV were sponsoring Jackass and they had the MTV and Burton uh, freestyle competition and Jackass were in. Um, and I went to the party and met them all. So that was kind of cool. Oy. So it was a kind of cool. Like, it, it was a good, it was a great. I just used to bluff it though. You know, yeah. like I just was like, I always looked, like I was probably brilliant at snowboarding until anybody saw me snowboarding. And then, then so as long as I stood about, yeah. like I just had such nice gear. So yeah. all the gear, no idea. Yeah, yeah that's what I was going to say. Just thinking of a title of this podcast already. How to <laughs> bluff through life. I, bluff, I honestly, I've just bluffed through everything. I'm such a charlatan. I, <laughs> I, I have this like complete imposter syndrome in everything I've done. I, and the same with comedy. It's like I've bluffed my way into this and I still still don't feel like I get paid for most of my gigs and, and that's lovely but I still feel like such an imposter and any day I'll get found out. I think everybody suffers through that. Yeah. I think everybody does. Like I've got mad imposter syndrome all the time. The only thing that I'm certain for is this bloody podcast because I actually wanted to do it. Yeah. You know, like interviewing people and talking to them. But now I'm finding myself interviewing people on my TikTok and now people are asking me, can you do an interview thing for the RAC arena yeah, for, for an event coming cool. up? And I'm like, yeah, sick. Yeah. And But it's just what I do. So I feel more confident now. But How um, long have you been doing it? Over four years. So we're at the same point. We started yeah, there. yeah, yeah. So we're getting good at it. Maybe, yeah, yeah. maybe that's it. So we, we're, we've, we've <laughs> faked enough and now we're starting to make it. I don't believe it though. It's funny because uh, like people will message you and, and say like really nice things. And I, you do that thing, you know, like if somebody says you look nice, you have to negate it. If like somebody says you've lost weight, you're like, no, no, I'm actually still as fat. You know, like you'll do that whole, like you can't take a compliment. Why do you think that is? Um, because I'm Scottish and we're brought up in the in the bog of humanity where the only... Like, when I got married, my gran said to me on my wedding day, I thought you were meant to be fat. Now, that sounds like a horrible thing for your gran to say, but that was her way of being nice. Yeah. You know, like, she couldn't say... And, and you know, like, my, my dad, um, when my gran died... Um, he had a brother and a sister who both died before him and before my gran. And when my gran died, she whispered in his ear, I wish you died before George or Margaret. What the fuck? Now, now oh, that sounds horrific, right, to hear from your mother on her die. But my dad did not take that as, like, a horrible thing. That was her way of saying, translated... That she missed her two children that had died young mm. and that she was sad that my dad... But that's not how you articulate it in Scotland. You say things like that, you know. Uh. It's not like... I mean, we watch a lot of American TV. We watch a lot of films where, you know, Mommy, Mommy, I love you, Mommy, you know, and it's all this, like, oh, you know, uh, the dying deathbed, you know, and, and they're all doing their big, you know, look, oh, you were a wonderful child. That is not reality. The reality is it's a physical function that, you know, we all say... We don't say Hollywood things. We don't. You no. Know? Well, I don't know my dad's ever said he loved me. Yeah. I'm sure he does, but mm. I, doubt, I doubt he's ever said Well, it. it's made you more resilient through life. Yeah. Could, it depends. It depends on how you grow up. You could talk about nature and nurture. Like 
I grew up with a lovable mum. I didn't grow up with the, with the dad. I had a stepdad that I never really clicked with, apart from a couple of years when I migrated here and he got me into footy and that was our little bond that we had yeah. for a little while. But most of the time I always saw him as I was just bothering him. Anytime yeah. I asked him for something, it was a bother. Yeah. But my mum, she carried me the whole time um, up until about four years old when I got too big. But like she um, – that emotionally carried me, still does. Yeah. You know, like now more and I'm like it, we've flipped the, the tables. Now I'm emotionally carrying her. Yeah. But I'm just regurgitating all the shit she taught me. And it's it's made me more resilient because at the beginning I'd get bullied at school. I'd come home and she's like, who the fuck are those guys? Yeah. Who gives a shit? And now I say the same thing. When I was a, when I was a school teacher, I didn't swear, but I said, you thought you're getting bullied. Who cares? Who are these people? Yeah. But 2020, I was teaching 2019 and 2020 before I fucked off and started doing TikToks for money. <laughs> um, yeah, the kids didn't perceive it that well because they were cotton wooled more. Do you feel like it's a huge difference? Because I've got a, I've got a I friend. Was, yeah, I was bullied horribly at school. I mean, but yeah, lot, that's Glasgow, a lot, right? A lot of, well, a lot of um, comedians, I think, come from that bullying. Yeah. So probably a bit of itchy nose. And I was bullied horribly by a group of people all through primary and secondary school. And a funny thing happened. There was nothing funny about it. But my parents would, um, they'd never talk about it. They'd see you coming in mm. with like a bloodied lip. And, and I used to get hair pulled out and you'd have like bald patches. And, and my mum would say things to me like, go and sort your hair. You know, like it was like, an, my sister used to walk home at the same time as me and she would cross the road as I was getting a kick in outside school because she was embarrassed at it. And, you know, so it wasn't that whole like, you know, if you're getting bullied, you know, like I talk to my kids and we sit down and we're like, explain it away. When I was brought up, like that wasn't how it was. You just got on with it. You, yeah. you endured it, you mm. know, against your will. But if, at last year, hilariously, I got a DM from um, a woman um, called Pamela because um, that's <laughs> her name. <laughs> Look straight at the camera there. Pamela. Um, I'll not give you her, her uh, surname, but you know who you are. And uh, <laughs> she sent me a DM just going, oh, I was a real bitch to you in school. And, you know, that was really unfair. And I feel bad about it. And, uh, you know, I'm not an alcoholic. Are you not, though, Pamela? And um, <laughs> this is not a cry for help. But yes, it is, actually. But, you know, I really wanted to say, you know, after all this time, it was really unfair. And I'm like... Bitch, please, for, you know, what, 45 years down the track, you're sorry for what you did. I was like, you don't get my forgiveness. You don't get me responding to this. You don't get, I just thought, you can just, you can just live with your guilt, mate, you know, because I very <laughs> much doubt, um, I very much doubt you suffered the way I did. And I just thought it was extraordinary that she had the nerve to, um, to DM me in some sort of like cathartic, she must have been going to therapy and they were like, you know, sort your shit out before you, <laughs> before you die, you alcoholic bitch. But um, I was like, nah, you know, like just not, nah, I'm not, I don't forgive mm. you because, you know, I think you're pathetic. And I did look her up on Facebook and so actually I was looking a lot better than she was. So that was quite nice. <laughs> but um, I went out that night, the night I got the DM, I took it. I printed it off and I, and I went and I read it out at an open mic thing and then just did like, I improvised like a 15 minute set around this and it actually felt great, you know, because what I said, I said is like, there's, there's three things you can do in that instance. You can DM back, it's okay, I've grown up and I'm much better looking than you and my life's great. You know, you could have done that. You could ignore it. Or you can recite it on stage, record <laughs> it, and maybe one day send it to Pamela. Um, we're not, I didn't do it because I just thought, I'm a bigger person than that, but I did enjoy that. But I just thought it was like, I just thought it was the worst of humanity that, like, just some things aren't forgivable, you know, like, and I'm like, oh, you were having a hard time, so you used to pull my hair out and kick me in the teeth. Mm, that's okay then. Well, how old was that? What? How old was she, you guys, when that uh, was happening? It was all the way through primary school, sort of like, <laughs> sort of from about like eight or nine to about 14. Oh, yeah. So we're not talking like 
one summer mm. you were a bitch. It was a huge amount of my life. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's a, a I'm not good at running, though. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right, the way I look at it, and, and this is something I tell the kids when I was teaching them at school, the people that are mean to you now will become different people years from now. Yeah. But they won't mean shit to you. And if no, they, they won't. But, but they'll be different people. They will have matured in some sort of way. And then, and that's kind of why I personally would, would probably just reply to them saying, oh, good, hope your kids aren't fuckheads See, you're like a you better, were. Per, you're a better person no, than but me, I, but I would say, I would say, I hope your kids weren't as bad as you are mm. because hopefully they're better people than you were. The thing you know? is, though, is if I opened the channel of conversation with her, I wouldn't stop, you know, yeah. like, uh, like because it, it was very, very hurtful to get that DM because it kind of brings it all back mm. and, like, you never forget it. But I just thought, oh, and after all this time, you're still popping into my life, like, yeah. you know, like you've got some entitlement. I, and, yeah, I didn't forgive her. I don't forgive her and I just think, yeah, yeah. I hope, I hope yeah. you're as... Yeah, I'm, not, I'm not judging no, 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 you no. and your I've way about it. I've said to my it. children, because at various points in their life, they've been, they've had issues with other kids and I'll say things, I, I'm like, I'm, I don't give them the traditional answers, but I will say to them, the people that are bullying you are sad and pathetic and yeah. unhappy and probably jealous of you for whatever. I was smarter than most of the kids yeah. I was at school with and that was what I was picked on for being, like, super brainy and, like, that was your thing. And it's like, well, I'm not going to pretend to be as thick as you, Pamela, um, <laughs> <laughs> to um, to make your life feel better. And, yeah. and So I'll tell my kids that. I'll say they're, they're sad, pathetic people and just be grateful you're not as bad as them. But it is a crap thing to go through. Yeah, you know? it is. And especially like she would have hit you up because she's seen you succeed in a in a new way. I wonder. And like how I see that, and this is my other way. This is my demon side now talking. <laughs> um, like, I would have I wouldn't have opened the channel up, but if I did, I would have said something like, Oh, so uh, you came across me, I'm doing well now, yeah. you thought to reach out. Because yeah. it's the same thing with me. I've actually had this happen too, in a way. Um, not not my bullies or anything. Like I don't have demons anymore. They can all get <laughs> fucked. But I've had ki- people that I haven't talked to in over 10 years. Yeah. Like I'm 32 now and when I was 22, I'd be working with specific people who are older than me or even my f- friends at the time. 10 years later, they all have kids, yep. five, six, seven yep. years old. And some of those uh, younger, when I was younger, those those people older than me have teenage kids. Yeah. And that's my prime demographic on TikTok. Oh, right. So now they're coming, hitting me up. This has happened like a handful of times. Oh, because now you're cool. You're They've cool got kid. leverage. And their kids are going, oh. Oh, my God, you know him? Can you invite oh, him over? Mate. And I'm like. Yeah, bitch, please. First time it was cool, but then I'm like, wait, no. this is happening regularly. Why, why are you hitting me up now just to, are you not cool enough for your kids? You need me to come and carry? Like the, the, best, the best time though, and it's because it's my mother. <laughs> She's a school teacher. She had a she, on my on her phone. There's a screen like her screen's me wallpaper, right? Golden child. Cute. Just kidding. Uh, locked <laughs> screen is me, and unlocked screen is my sister. So uh, ah, number two child. So when yeah, <laughs> she's the younger one. But yeah, <laughs> we're not when, made to when she, but we do. When <laughs> she checks the time, it's me. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> the kids would would see it yeah, yeah. the phone, and they would be like, Miss, why do you have him as your wallpaper? Did you know he's TikTok famous? Yeah. She's like, yeah, that's my son. Aww. And then, like, I remember that year specifically, she she called me. She had said, I'm struggling. My year sevens are a bunch of fucks. She went and spoke to them? No, I didn't speak to them. They literally a week later discovered that I was her son and they've all been saints. Isn't that cute? Yeah, and now, like, a lot of my comments on TikTok are, um, my mum, uh, your mum is my teacher at school or your mum was my teacher at school. I was actually out on Saturday night um, watching some fringe shows. Sorry, not yours. <laughs> and um, at the end I went out to, to a bar and, um, yeah, there's some of her old students were there, like 19 yeah, years yeah. old, and just fresh up. Come speak to me. That's it's, cute, isn't it? That's legacy, you know? Yeah, it is. It's nice. And I think that's the hard thing about being a teacher is it's, it can be a thankless task, but I still keep in touch with, quite a few of my old students and they're grateful um, for you they were grateful I, I was a great teacher and I loved it you know and I put an awful lot of passion in, in my like I put every, I'm, I'm balls deep in everything like no matter what it is 
I'm in. I'm fully invested. It's just as well I don't understand cryptocurrency <laughs> <laughs> or gambling because, like, I, I yeah. just like I'd be I'd be in on that. Yeah. Podcast know? title idea number two: How to be balls deep in anything. <laughs> I know. I just I've just jumped like I just jump into things <laughs> so enthusiastically and then just run with it. Like I. I just I've been that done that my whole life. It's Have like, you had a catastrophic failure at one point where you did that and just went fuck? No, that, that was cooked. No, no. Everything I've set my task to, I've I've been pretty good at. I years and years ago, I I wanted to box, and and I trained for boxing for about five six years. Jesus. And then I was really I was really good. Um, I, I just used to train all the time. I used to like go to the gym all the time, go to the boxing clubs all the time, spar all the time. And this is previous to when women really did box. It wasn't, there weren't like boxer size classes. There weren't, there wasn't any women doing boxing at that time. And I absolutely loved it. And I wanted to do that. But <laughs> This is a funny story. We couldn't get any women to box with because I'm I'm tiny and I, at the time so I'm still the same height as I was then, <laughs> uh, five foot two, and I was fifty kilos. I was just tiny, and so to find someone, there was no one in Scotland boxing at that weight, and so I used to spar with a friend of mine, Graham who was a guy who was the same size as me, and that was great. But I could never find opponents to actually have fights with because I was ready, I was fight ready, but there was nobody to fight with. And um, I went to the university boxing club one night and the trainer there, an old guy called Bill Shark, he said to me, oh, he goes, we've got a surprise for you. And I said, what? And he went, we've got a woman for you tonight. And I was like, yes, you know, yes, <laughs> this, this is it. And he's like, just go and get changed, come out. And... Um, I come out in the rings there and, and there's my opponent. And this lady was called Rima and she was from Russia. Oh. Weirdly enough. <laughs> um, and she would have been 5'10", 5'11". You're fucked. <laughs> built like a brick shit house. Oh she was a, she used to train weightlifters in Russia for Olympics. She was like a trainer. She was like, she had these traps on She's her on neck. the roids. Oh, she was like. Yeah. And I looked at her and I looked at Bill Sharkey and I looked at her back and I'm like, you know, she's she would have been 20, 30 kilos heavier yeah, that's in not... muscle <laughs> and <laughs> about a foot taller than me. And I just looked at her and I looked at him and he went, go on then. And I'm like, like and, and at that moment, um, this is talking about jumping in deep at things you're ill prepared for. I'm looking around, like hoping that, like, do you remember like, when you, like, you're waiting for your mum? It'll go, oh, Gillian can't do the boxing today, you know, our dinner's ready and she's got homework to do. I was looking around, like, looking for some. There's got, it was like the snowboarding thing at the top of the cliff. I'm looking around going, there's got to be an excuse, there's got to be a way out of this, and there was no way out of it. And I'm looking around and everybody's looking at me, everybody's looking at me. And the fear of going in a boxing ring to know you're going to get battered is... Like, people say stand-up's hard, and I'm like, yes, yeah, stand-up is hard, but that time going in that box ring with that lassie was the fear of death. You know, like, oh you're like, I, I could, this, I'm, like, and to put that foot over the rope to go into ultimate beating, you know, and, and I did it, you know, I don't, I never threw up. And so we got in the ring, and they take you in the middle of the ring, touch gloves, you go to your corners and we're going to go like, we're going to do two, three minute rounds. Now that sounds like nothing. That sounds like nothing if you're not in the <laughs> ring with a Russian weightlifting monster, right? It was like Rocky. With Rimmed Dolph, by Rima. When Dolph. Ivan, Ivan Drago. <laughs> um, and, I, and, and I'm stood in the corner and I'm looking at her and I'm going, she's not getting any weird looking at her. You know, she was enormous. And the bell went, we touched gloves. And I did, I did what I always do in, in these moments. I survive. And I survived by going on the back foot, backpedaling round the ring, 
for the whole three minutes. <laughs> she never called me, right? And I go faster and faster. She got more and more pissed off. Bill Sharkey's going, stand and fight. And I'm going, fuck you, Bill. And I'm like, back, 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 pedal, back, pedal, back, pedal, back, pedal. And then the bell rang. They're like that, no contest out you get. That was the end of it, right? And I was like, I'm okay with this, right? Because I, she never laid a glove on me. No, she honestly, not a mark on me. So everybody was pissed off, right? But I was alive. And I'm like, no, I'm fine with this. It's fine. And then we get into the changing room. And there's just me and her because we're the only women there, right? And she didn't speak much English, I don't think. And uh, so I'm sitting on the bench, you know, these like benches in the change room. There's like the lockers here. And like, you're quite close to the lockers, maybe about like two or three feet. Yeah. And uh, she comes out the shower, stark naked, right? And I'm like averting my gaze because you don't want to look creepy or anything. <laughs> I didn't know. What, and also I wasn't catching her eye because I was embarrassed and running away from her. And Well, it's okay. Um... And um, I'm I'm sat on the bench, and she's right in front of me, her back to me, and she bends over and pretends to do something with her toes for quite an extended period of time, and mooned me. Her butt was like about three, maybe thirty centimeters from my face, and I'm sitting. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, and this is the way you dominate someone. It's like, you never laid a glove on me, and now I'm going to put my bum in your face. And it was like, when I think about it now, I just think it was really funny. And I've told people that story, and they went, I think she was coming on to you. And I was like, I didn't see the signs. I didn't yeah, see you're the in. signs. You're and it was like... Um, I think it was like animals, you know, like when they're trying to show dominance. It's like, you couldn't actually hit me in the ring and now I'm just going to put my bare arse in your face. And, yeah, that was my only female. Actually, no, there was one other. There was a um, girl who did rugby who's also short but, like, really big. And uh, I didn't fear her so much because she was the same height. And I thought, yeah, you're not that fit. And anyway, and I knew she hadn't done boxing for very long. And uh, the bell rang. And I, within about 10 seconds, I hit her square on the bridge of her nose. And do you know like in Tom and Jerry cartoons, when when they, when they one of them gets hit and they, the wee birds go above their head, she did that. She just stood there going... And... and Right across here, like you could just see it. Like the minute I hit her, that like that was it. She was spaced out, and that fight was like ended at that point. And then, so you're one, one out and one. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. But um, yeah, that was it. So like, I'd I'd love to have done boxing, and and had I been younger when I started, by the time I was ready, I, you know, if it had been ten years later, there would have been opponents, and I reckon. I would have been quite good. No, you could be a coach now if you want. I could have been a contender. Undefeated. Undefeated coach. I loved coach. it though. I, and I love boxing. I went and saw Mike Tyson fight and yeah. seen a lot of people, great fights. And um, yeah, that was something. That's something I could have been, you know, but um, that moment passed <laughs> <laughs> and I survived. But I still think about that girl. The the rugby playing girl, um, I saw her in Aberdeen um about a week after I hit her, and she she had like the mask of Zorro of bruising. Oh god! <laughs> so, like, she had like two black eyes and right across. Wow! She never looked at me. <laughs> <laughs> did you did you moon her? No, nah, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but if in trouble, that can work. Yeah, you know, like if you're if you're frightened, so you're dominant. You know, yeah. So now you're taking hits on stage. Um, <laughs> let's talk yeah. about heckling. How, how how do you handle hecklers? Oh, I'm like hecklers don't bother me too much um, because. I, I portray a savageness that um, most people slightly fear me. They kind of like... Intimidating? Yeah, I think I'm a wee bit intimidating because I've got that like, I'm a, a ex-teacher, I'm a mum and, and, I, and I used to box and I think that's <laughs> sort of like, I think people sense it. So if they if they want to, if they try... What if, like, what, if, what if I found Rima and I put her in the... In the audience and got her to heckle you. I could take her down yeah? now. You yeah, reckon? like I think about it in hindsight. I just think I should have, like, honestly, if I'd stood and fought to a toe with her, I would have, uh, my nose, I have been. Would have of Zorro as yeah. well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would have been worse than Mask. Yeah. So tell me about your roasting. You, you were roasting someone before we turned the cameras on. Um, yeah, I did a roast um, 
which I've never done before. And I always quite fancied it because I love watching roasts. Yeah. Um, and I thought, that looks fun. I'll give that a go. And um, I did a roast of another comedian. And um, I, I did really well. I did um, I did some really great jokes. Um, and he he was less competent, she always <laughs> say. But um, I really did enjoy it, but it kind of left me feeling a bit... I don't know. It made me feel a bit sullied. There's something about just being mean, mm. like constantly. Yeah. It's actually quite draining on you. Yeah, it is. You know, like to do like if someone heckles you, like I, I can usually shut people down in a way that is fun and engaging and nobody feels victimized or or picked on. Yeah. And I think that's the key to heckling. If, if somebody heckles you, you, you want to shut them down, but you don't want to make them out to be a t an absolute tit because that's when it goes wrong. Because yeah, you all see all those heckling ones. When they go wrong, it's kind of when they're a bit too mean. Mm. So I think if you can shut somebody down and not humiliate them, you, you'll have a better chance yeah. of actually shutting them down. Do you, um, do you come prepared with the roast or do you make it up on the spot? No, you come prepared. Um, so you write the roasts. So you write them as sort of jokes. You know who the, your opponent is. And then you both exchange. Um, but mine's were really funny. And his, like um, he's um, from Zimbabwe and I said that um, he does. He wears links no lamara, <laughs> 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 which is really good. Um, so my jokes were all. Um, some of them were really grim, but they, like they were funny. But they've got to be mean, and that's like that's what's really. Mm. Um, I said that um, he's so overweight that he he flies um, coach and his arse flies freight. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, so you pick physical yeah. things, but you also pick, like, cultural stuff. And So what about in this time and, and age of doing that roles reversed? Mm. Let's say I'm roasting someone of the female yeah. gender yep. they identify as. Yep. You have to say that now. Yep. And they were overweight, clearly, yep. and I would say the same thing. I think it's okay in a roast because when you go in for a roast, you've signed up for... Do what you want, right? Mm. Do what you want. And that's yeah. the deal with roasts. There can't be um there can't be constraints in it because it because it then can be super difficult. Like um I I had um a black opponent and I was nervous of that because you don't want to um do stuff that will make you look like a racist. Because people can clip it yeah, out of yeah, context. Yeah. And, and and then so that's difficult. So if you had a transgender person also that gives you more like you have to be more careful about how you word it so you don't come across as being some horrible. So I think in roasts it's fair game to say what you like. And I've seen tons of roasts online. If you're overweight, like we love an overweight person <laughs> on on a roast because that like I, because that's <laughs> the way like you a, say it. it you know because you, if, you're going, roast, if you're going to roast <laughs> anybody you want them to be overweight don't you more meat to Especially, go down yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you just need an extra heavy duty spit but um <laughs> i yeah it's fair game i mean i got roasted on being ugly and old and overweight and i just thought yeah knock yourself out my jokes yeah. are better and i won me Who's your who's your inspiration for com comedy? Um, Billy Connolly is my favourite comedian, and Kevin Bridges, um, also another Scottish comedian. But I also, I mean, I love. There's so many comedians I love, but I grew up with Billy Connolly, mm. and I think I loved his descriptiveness, and that's what I love. I love describing things. Yeah. I like using silly words to describe things that make yeah. me feel. Like that paint a picture in people's heads, you know. So so that's that's I suppose not an inspiration, but I suppose he was the first comedian I ever really sit connected with, you know. Yeah, so, I remember watching Billy Connolly when I was yeah. a kid. My favourite all time Jim Carrey. I he love Jim Carrey. Jim Carrey's phenomenal and I still think he's super funny now and I love how he skates with that edge of darkness as well yeah but there's so many fabulous comedians i mean there's so many people that inspire you i suppose but i i suppose i inspire myself because i never give up 
and and I just give things a go, and and I shouldn't, because I'm always out of my depth, you know. <laughs> like I'm just like I've never, I've never understood. My dad's used to say to me, I think he wanted me to be a boy because he had three daughters and I was the last, and he used to say, you can achieve anything you want in life if you try hard enough, and. Although that's not entirely true, there's a bit of that sticks with me, and I think I don't know self-limitation. I just think, I won't do that. I'll do it. You know, like, I should be self-aware enough to go, nah, this is not what you should be doing. But I'm not. I love a challenge. I love things that are really hard, you know? That's not a euphemism. Um, I like a challenge. I like things to be difficult. I like things to be harder than I'm capable of. Yeah, is that how is that how your husband proposed to you? You <laughs> no. wouldn't marry me, pussy. No, well, he's ten years younger than me. Oh, hey. Hey. cougar, oh, cougar. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so he, when he met me, I was just like a tornado, you mm. know, and that's what he married. He, he knew I was like this, you know. I never hid it. I wasn't pretending to be some nice docile. I mean, he cat. found himself an eighteen-year-old, really. Well, he did. Yeah, I think <laughs> he struggles. He's older than me in his mind, for <laughs> sure. You know, like, he's absolutely the adult in our relationship, and I'm just a ludicrous um, manifestation of too many ideas and not one single train of thought. You know? Yeah. Do you do you uh, see? Do you have like? ADHD or anything Probably like that. All of it, mate. I think, yeah. Let's let's not. You know, like I, I absolutely like. There's um, that that's a thing now. Everybody, you know, will say, you know, they have this and that. And I think I absolutely do. It is there any point in getting diagnosed for me? No, because I got through school because I was bright. Um, but I don't see the point in it now because mm. I just think. It's part of what I am. It, yeah. it sort of, I'm not saying it's my superpower. Um, maybe it is my superpower, you know, because it makes me hyper focus on things. Um, it's very helpful. Yeah. And yeah. so that is part of my makeup. And I don't want to be medicated for it because I think <laughs> if, I, if I took away a bit of that, then maybe I wouldn't have the creative focus that yeah, I have. Yeah. I'm the same. I'm the same, I don't want to. I feel happy with... I'm all right with me now. I'm happier with me now at 56 than I've ever been at me. I'm more at peace with myself and I'm more accepting of my flaws than yeah. I've ever been. I've always thought I was just too weird, too odd, yeah. didn't fit in, didn't fit any norm, and now I know that that's okay. Yeah, without, without going into... Jumping to conclusions of becoming a therapist. <laughs> Next, what would your advice be to be uh, to women around your age who are struggling <sighs> to find themselves, maybe, or they've they've lost their sense of identity, or maybe they've had kids yep. in their thirties and they haven't really recovered yep. from that? Because you know, you know, like that that's what happens, right? Yeah, it's what happens. I mean, you do lose your identity. All I would say is. You know what? Like sometimes even the smallest things can make you feel better about yourself. Get your hair done. Go go and go and buy yourself something nice that'll make you feel physically better. I think sometimes our physical um, happiness, like how we feel, we we look on the outside, absolutely correlates to the inside. So um, do something to make yourself not hate how you how you look because sometimes that can manifest itself into that inner sort of that spiral of decline and try something different you know it doesn't matter if you fail at it doesn't matter if you're rubbish at it just pick a stupid thing it doesn't matter what it is there's a ton of things out there that might resonate with you you know and you might be absolutely fucking brilliant at one of them but if you don't try you're never going to know and you're not dead yet jennifer coolidge is at her hottest most supreme being at the age she is and she stands on stage with a tummy and owning the fact she's no plastic surgery she's just a real genuine woman at the height of her career and it's happened now in her 50s and i just say get out there and give something a go you, you know you're a long time dead yeah. you'll regret it if you don't you know mm, yeah exactly i'm not saying i'm an i don't think i'm an inspiration to anyone but i'm certainly um 
I'm I'm not ready to retire. That's for sure. <laughs> you That's know? good. That's good. So in terms of retirement, um, and I'm segueing this to yeah. can- cancel culture in okay. a weird way because people, some comics retire early yes. because of this. Yes. I, I'll give you my personal opinion about it first and then I'd love to hear your viewpoint. But I feel that cancel culture has kind of done a full circle where now it's on its way out again where people yeah. have just kind of gone, you know what, take a fucking joke, yeah. stop sulking, get on with your life. If it upsets you, scroll on, keep moving, you know. And I've, I grew up in Kalgoorlie. I grew up in the country where all, everyone's a dickhead to each other. You, you make a joke about it. If it upsets you, you'd be like, oh, well, today's, tomorrow's another day. Whereas now you, you say one thing and you're offending someone that doesn't even fit the demographic because yeah. they're offended for them. What are your thoughts? Um, I think comedy is like Netflix. There's a lot of things you can watch. If you don't like it, flick on to the next one. That's what I'd say. If you pay money to go and see a comedian and they're not your cup of tea, vote with your feet. Get up and leave. And, and, and you, you, know, you, you can tell all your friends that you hated them. But that, that's your... That's your entitlement as a punter, I think. Um, as a comedian, you can say anything you like, but there are consequences to your actions as well. You know, like you can say things, they they may come back to haunt you and you have to be mindful of that. If you're okay with that, say what you like, but we don't live in a bubble. We don't live in a bubble of like, yeah, you can just say what you want and it's okay, sticks and stones will break your bones. The world really isn't that naive. You know, sometimes you can't retract things. Sometimes you hear things that somebody will say and that stays with you for a long time. Mm. Um, so I'm not saying you should overanalyze everything you say because I say a load of shit on stage that I never plan to say. It comes out and sometimes we, we go over the line. Sometimes we say things we regret um, and that's part of being... A, a comedian and part of being a performer and um I just think I don't want to get cancelled but I also I, I want to be able to say what I want to say I think comedy is one of the last bastions of free speech um and for that that's a great thing and and, and there's comedians for everyone there's super left wing and super right wing and you can pick somewhere along that spectrum. There's people as woke as hell. Go and see them if that's your thing. There's people who do really edgy, racy stuff. Go and see that. Come and see me. I swear a lot and tell about jokes about um, having a fat belly and avoiding sex. I mean, that's my thing, you know. But we there's there's a comedian for everyone, and not you. You just pick the right person, you know. Yeah. Yeah. When you're on stage and you have a set of audience that have come to watch you, a majority of them there for you or do you find that there are some that go, I'm, not, I'm actually voting with my feet, this woman's mad? Oh, I, I think most people get quite like my manicness on stage because I'm, I'm very high energy and, and I like to try and win people over, you know. Like I think when you come out on stage, most people go, oh, she looks like a nice lady. <laughs> and then it spirals out of control and they realise, mm, maybe not such a nice lady, <laughs> but a funny lady, you know. So that's that's where I go from. I don't, I don't want, I never want anyone to leave, never. I'd never want, I would see that as a failure. If someone walked out and left because they hated me that much, I would be devastated because I don't want people to dislike me. I, you want to be loved, you know. Mm. There's a bit of that in comedy. Sense of belonging. Yeah, it's like we want we all, we're, we're there for attention. Yeah, we want you to all love us. I mean, I I don't really want friendship. I just want five, ten, fifteen minutes of love from strangers. Yeah, that's fine. You so know? when you how do you read your audience when you get out there? You have to read the audience absolutely. Um, I've got material that's suitable for different age groups, different types, different levels of sobriety, you know, like, because <laughs> if they're hammered, you know, like, you can really, like, have a super lot of fun. So late nights are a better No, Not spot? always late nights. Sometimes I've done some shows at Fringe where it's been quite late night and they've been sober as a judge, so that's difficult. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah, I know. What's the uh, prime spot, you think? I think probably about seven, eight o'clock mm. is, is a nice time. But, I mean, I like late night shows as well. Um, I did a show called Fat Cave, which is a late, late night show. And it's got some really amazing comedians on it. And I, I was lucky enough to be on it this year. 
And um, I was very nervous because I felt out my depth again, you know, because they were all really good comedians. I was like, oh, I'll be rubbish. And I just thought, nah, trust, trust. You're about trust the thing that's in you that's there, and I I ended up by the end of it I really feel I I, I had nailed it and it was great and it felt great coming off from having really good comedians watching you yeah. and going she's not a lame old bird yeah you know? so when you when you're reading the crowd and you start and you re, have you ever realised that oh shit I've picked the wrong yeah. how do you pivot midway through oh like if you do crowd work with people in the crowd. Like some people are really good for it. Some, I suppose, the more you do that, the better you can pick a good mark. Um, but sometimes you'll ask somebody something, you get nothing. You have to be prepared if you're going to do crowd work and you ask us. Like if I'll, I'll, I'll say things like you know, like opening questions like, "Is there, are there any virgins?" And then that nobody ever owns up to that. And then I'll just pick on a young guy who looks like a virgin. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have a bit of fun. So they don't need to respond. So like if you <laughs> ask if you ask a question, I know I'm terrible. Um, if you ask a question and you get no reply, then you have to have a backup. Like how do you get out of that without looking like oh, they haven't answered yeah. you back. Mm -hmm. Like last night, I, I I asked a question which was, um, so the joke was, um, like I really, I have this fantasy about a man in uniform. And, and I said, ladies, we all like men in uniform. And they all went, yeah. And I said, what do you, what do you like? And at that point, nobody answered. And I said, it's firemen. We all like firemen. And I said, well, I told my husband this. And he went and he joined the scouts. <laughs> <laughs> But I didn't need, like, I didn't need a response from them. But if somebody had said, fireman, or if somebody had said something, I could have done a wee bit on that and then come to fit yeah. him. So you need to be able to, like, reverse, like yeah. hard, hard, fast reverse. And that's, that's, I think that's one of my things that I'm thinking about if I was to start. You don't it's... start with, you don't start with crowd work. Do you know what start with crowd work? No, 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 Go, not car work, like a contingency plan. Yeah, well... I don't think you need to think like that. When you first start out, write your five minutes and just rehearse it and go for it. Yeah, don't you, you, I can't remember shit. I've got the worst memory. Yeah, well, it doesn't get easier with age, mate. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like I'm, like, I'm five minutes from Alzheimer's, but I mean, you know, I'm still there. So how do you, how do you remember a 10, 15 minute set? Oh, I just talk shit and go off in tangents. Like yeah. I have no like. St I think I, that's what I would do. But it's oh. like, how do you how do you know if you go on a tangent? How do you do you go and try and make a hit every couple of minutes, every yeah. couple of seconds, or yeah. do you go for the long long game? I don't do long form stuff. I do long form stuff, but I want jokes all the way yeah. through the long form. Mm. Um, I've written sets about everything in my consciousness, really. Amazing. Like, uh, I, I, could, I reckon I could do that, but yeah. I just remember, like, I'd get out on stage and I wouldn't have stage fright. I'd just forget what I'd have to fucking say. But if, the more you do it and, and the more, like, so I forget tons of stuff that I've written and, and it's really good. And then sometimes during a set I'll be, I'll be just improvising a bit and then I remember another <laughs> bit and then I'll do that and then that's that triggers a synapse in your brain that goes to another bit to go. It's like That's, a, it's like yeah. a very, it's like a mind map. You know, you kind of go. Yeah. Like I used to do very linear sets, and sometimes I do linear sets. Like if you're doing club sets and you've been paid for seven minutes, it's usually a finite thing. But if you're doing longer sets, you can then play about with it more. You can go a little bit And random. you don't get longer sets at the beginning. No. Nobody trusts you for more than five <laughs> minutes. And that's a good thing. Because yeah. It, yeah. That's enough. So you can learn a linear set. Yeah. I read, I read one day, I forget who it was from, but it was like a famous comic back in the day. And he said that you need to write every day at the same time. He said you need to sit down half an hour or an hour and just write. Whatever comes to mind. I write every day. Yeah. Every day, even and I don't write at the same time every day because I've got two kids and another job. Yeah, yeah. So like I fit it in where I fit it in. I take voice memos on my watch. I take voice memos on my phone. I've got notes. I've got notebooks. I've got stuff everywhere. Mm. It's chaotic. It's schizophrenic in my brain, and so is my note taking. Yeah. But if you write it down, there'll come a point where you get an opportunity to tell a joke about a thing and you'll remember yeah. that. You might not remember it 
every time you're on stage, because I don't, mm. but at some point you go, like I do a whole joke about Costco, about going to Costco, like um, you you get diabetes entering Costco, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like and, and I had a whole bit about it and I always forget to do my Costco stuff, but then... The other night there, I remembered a bit about it and it segued into it. So yeah. that's how I work. It's not ideal. Mm. There's, as I say, Seb, there's no plan to my life. It's just, it just, it's haphazard, yeah. you know. Fair enough. And that's the joy of it, I think. Yeah, I love that. Um, I'm a comedian. It's about to start. Ooh, Hypothe- I'm no, no, no. Hypothetically, I'm not saying right, okay. I'm studying. Okay. I'm, I've already okay. make people laugh on TikTok. That'll do. <laughs> Is my fix. Um, what advice do you have? Um, don't dress like a tramp. Nobody <laughs> likes it. Yeah. Um, don't be horrible to anybody because it's it, it will never. Don't try and shock people. Mm. Um, write what you know about. Don't write about abstract concepts that are beyond you. Keep it real. Like if you like sitting in your bedroom masturbating and playing you know, tour of duty, I don't know, Minecraft, whatever, write about that, you know, um, if you like knitting and cats, write about that, write about stuff you know about and it'll be genuine. I think audiences always know if you're authentic and you're genuine, yeah. you can't hide it. So if you, if you go like on stage and try and come across like, you know, Dave Chappelle, like nobody's going to buy it. Just, like if you, if your fixation is popping pimples and and you know online shopping, it doesn't matter what it is. There's relevance for everything. You know everybody's viewpoint is important. Um, so so just keep it real yeah. and 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 practice. You know and write and practice and write and and don't dress like a tramp. Yeah. That's that's my <laughs> advice. And be like be funny, but also if you want to do it. It's a huge commitment. It's a huge commitment. Um, I have never had a break from comedy in four years. I have. I've, I took two weeks off at Christmas, and it felt like I'd been away from it forever. It's like if you want to be good and you want to be successful, you have to do the work. There's no way around it. There's no shortcuts. There's no bypassing it. There's no jumping the front of the queue. It's. It's labour intensive. Yeah. And I, I find the same thing on social media. You do the hours. I, I just loved it yeah. at the start and I just kept doing it. But <laughs> it's a bit different for in person, um, I feel. Wolfie, Wolfie thinks I'm like he's convinced I'll, I'll be good. Um, but do, for do me it's what? open mic nights and things like that. They're and fun just, though. They're open mic. Yeah. I mean open mic is such fun. There's no expectations on you. Yeah, yeah. It's the only time in your comedy life where you can be shit and nobody's yeah. judging you. Once you get a bit of success, like every level of success, people are looking, expecting you to kill every time you go on stage. Yeah. And then if you don't, it's hugely disappointing. Whereas open that first honeymoon phase yeah, yeah. of just like you can just be, you can just be you, and you can try things, and nobody's going, oh, that was you know that was rotten. Never do it again. You just come back the next night mm. and be rotten and be rotten and be rotten, and then one day your dog shit set might not be as dog shit, you yeah. know, because it when, will be dog shit. What was what was your first year like? Dog shit? Nah. Now I've done I've done a lot of dog shit gigs, but I was never really that bad. I was never like I've seen bad. I have seen people that like I look at them and I just think they come back week after week after week, and I think if I was ever that bad, I don't know what your motivation is to come back. But they're driven by the same thing that drove me. Yeah. But I was naturally probably a bit funnier. Some people are natural That's comics helpful. and some people are are taught, like they t- train themselves. Mm. Um, and not every, you're either one or the other. Yeah. I'm, um, I'm hoping it's natural because I just. <laughs> it's, it's maybe easier if you're natural. That's what I like. That's what I like self awareness, talk about self awareness. I want to bring in something that I'm natural in, that I like, yeah. that I'm good at, yeah. and people like me doing yeah. it. That's like the ultimate golden formula. I think your physicality has a huge bearing on this. Mm. When you walk on stage, um, people, before you even open your trap, they'll make a judgment, right? Mm. 
like that first time, this is what I'm saying about not dressing like a tramp. If you want to dress like a tramp and that's your shtick, go for it. I'm only kidding. But if you have a physical um, presence mm. that is something, a point of difference, that automatically will engage an audience. Now, you're very tall yeah. and you're very striking. So I think that would be a good mm. initial thing. And for that, you have an advantage over some people. A lot of people look kind of a bit much of a muchness. Mm. So how do you, like, what's your point of view going on yeah. stage? That's what I doubled down in online. And that's what I doubled down in at school uh, as a teacher. Because when I went to, to get a job, um, I would make sure that I would come in yep. and give my resume. Yeah. Because that would always get me a job. Because they'd remember what you look like. Yeah. And and I now dress, I wear a lot of really bright colours on stage and it's a very purposeful thing that I do um, because it kind of wakes people up, you know, and they go, mm. oh, you know. And so what you look like weirdly is as much. Some people, like I, my dad always said I had a good face for radio um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks, Dad. Um, but I do think people have faces for comedy as well, mm -hmm. like how they look. Their yeah. look yeah. is a part of it. I think I think I'll uh, give it some more time, but I'm definitely more confident thinking about some ideas. It's like, yeah, my personal experience as a teacher, like Daniel Delby does it really well. Yeah, he's a school teacher, former school teacher now, and he's got his you know celebrant stuff and. His um, his thing with um, his who's rhyme thing and yeah. and I take inspiration from Dave all the time. Like he's written some of my TikToks and they went viral. Yeah, and he he's convinced I'd sell out like um, Asta. Well, we, well, you would. You'd have a following, but that in itself isn't going to help you. No, because the thing that's great about comedy is it levels everybody. Is a, it's like it doesn't matter like mm. what like you can have this amazing following people and they will come see you I mean there's famous people do comedy and people come to see them because they're famous mm. and they'll laugh it doesn't mean to say they're particularly good at comedy yeah now, I don't like that within comedy none of us want to be that person even though they're successful and they've yeah. fell in out arenas Jack Whitehall there's a great example in the UK Massive, massive star. Sells out every tour. I've watched his stand-up. It's so dog average. But he will fill out rooms and they'll all come and they'll laugh. <laughs> it's yeah. so funny. Yeah. And I just think nobody in comedy wants to be like, he's successful. Do you want to be successful or do you want to be funny? And me, I want to be funny yeah. and hopefully a bit successful. But I don't want if, – if somebody said to me like, you could become famous, like if you went on Big Brother or Married at First Sight, you got famous and then you started stand up. Oh, and don't all get me these started, people have come to see no. you because you're famous for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you're doing some old dog and pony yeah. stuff. Well, well, that's what I did with wedding photography. I leveraged my following and people started booking me as a wedding photographer. Yeah. Because they found me on TikTok and their kids were like begging their parents. And that's not a reference to that. That Being good at that doesn't mean you're yeah. good at that. Yeah. And so that's the problem with like having a following. If I was doing it and I was you, I'd tell nobody and I'd go and do, do the work incognito. And then when you get half decent, <laughs> then you can alert your fans and get them to come see yeah. you. Because I think the worst thing that you could probably do is have this like posse of like sycophants that are going, yeah, it's funny. <laughs> you know, like, I went to see Steve Martin at the Riverside Theatre, right? And I won tickets to go and see him. And he was massive. And the tickets were so expensive. And this place is packed. Thousands of people there to see Steve Martin. And the first 15 minutes of that show was his school photos. They would pop up him aged five and the audience just pissing themselves laughing. Oh, oh, the funniest thing. And then the next photo would come up. And I thought, imagine that is what... And, and he, did, he did very little stand-up. And what he did was so tired. And I just thought, that is just depressing. Yeah, you know? yeah. I mean, there's a comic here in Perth, I'm not going to mention who it is, but I used to watch them when I was growing up. 
Oh, I think yeah. And um, and they were hilarious back then. And now I'm older, watch this person a couple times, bore me to shit. Yeah. And and it was a shame because I had this expectation of them from when I was watching them. I was when I was younger. And I was just like, man. I mean, That's, good on them. Good on them for still going. But it's the double-edged sword of being famous, though, isn't it? It's like yeah. how to still stay relevant as a comedian when when you're famous because people are going to come and see you anyway. Yeah. So so you don't have to make people want to see mm. you. They're going to come. You've got a captive audience yeah. of adoring fans. And it's a bit like the same with music. You see people doing these big arena tours and you listen to them and you think, that's crap, you yeah. know, that you were probably way better when you wanted it. Yeah, exactly, and that's what I feel about. So if you don't want it mm. anymore, you hang yeah. your hat up and take up golf. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Scottish people invented that too. Yes, I know. So what, um, before we go, um, now you know a little bit about me, can mm. you give me a wee little roast? <laughs> I know you haven't prepared anything. <laughs> uh, you look like stretch Bora. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that one before. <laughs> All right, okay. Okay. Uh, what else? Oh, no, I can't do it on the a- spot. Appearance, Honestly, appearance. Your legs are like coconuts. Honestly, what's that about? <laughs> you can't shave your legs. That's a possibility. I'm just putting that out there. And I know a man with legs that hair, he's got a back even hair. You'll be like an orangutan on the back. You'll be close. How's the, how's I bet the... you can, I bet you could ha- I bet you could abs sail off your back, you know. <laughs> Just there you go. We roast not bad, not bad. <laughs> what about what about TikTok being popular on TikTok? Give me a give me a wee roast on that. Give me a genuine roast for influencers on oh, social media. Oh. Give me an absolute. No, I can't. No. Off, off the head, like you need to write them. Like, All right, it's next weird. time, next time, next time I'll give you, you some. Come on. You give me, you give me some time, topics. and I will come and I will. <laughs> no, you don't need to give me topics, mate. You just give me five minutes. I've seen your face now. You, know? <laughs> you look like Magnum PI light. You know, I've heard that before. <laughs> Magnum PI shite. I don't know. Um, <laughs> You know, I don't know. You look like um, Magnum fucked a beaver. I don't mm. know. There's a tooth thing there. Yeah. I think we could go somewhere with Magnum that. And the eyebrows, I like that. you know. I like that. With the teeth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Save a beaver. They called yeah. me that in primary oh, school. God, that was a good one. That. That's great. It's, yeah. it's, that's actually quite a good nickname. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be there for that. I think if I'm reincarnated, I'm going to come back as the bully. Yeah. Maybe that's what. And that's why I like. Maybe that is why I like the roast thing. Mm. Is it's an opportunity to be the bully for a bit. <laughs> but I didn't. It made me feel a bit icky, to be uh, honest. You, know, you seem like a nice man. Thank you. <laughs> well, hopefully everybody else enjoyed the uh, the stories. I sure I hope did. So. Um, for everybody, um, I'm trialing something new as well with the uh, wrap up and putting it at the front of the podcast, Ooh. we discussed... Um, a lot. There was a lot to unpack. Yeah. She gave me some snowboard stories, <laughs> uh, the time she got hit by a ski person. Um, we talked about uh, masturbation for a split second. <laughs> we talked about her um, her arch nemesis from primary school that she uh, she talked about on stage once. And uh, we, we uh, learnt a lot about how to become a stand-up comedian and uh, what it's like being someone who's uh, probably in her menopause right now. <laughs> Do you like that one? No, not really. You um, laughed? Oh, she laughed. She laughed. <laughs> we're all, we're all, we're all, we like to have fun here. Yeah, we're, we're fun. It was good. Uh, yeah, my eggs are rattling about and send me like raisins. They're gone. And I'm, <laughs> I'm good for that because uh, being sexually liberated when it, you're not interested in it anymore is fantastic. <laughs> you can focus on fun things and cheese. just forget about cheese. You know, cheese yeah. is it. Cheese, cheese is, is it. life, mate. Yeah, that's it. All right, guys. Uh, <laughs> you can find uh, Jill on uh, at Fringe. And uh, on Instagram and Facebook. I'm yeah. Jill Cordoner, Jill with a G. Um and you can see me about Pertham everywhere, mate. Yeah, get about like her. Like hairpiece. That's it. Yeah. Get about her. Thanks for listening. As always, good thanks. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>